Hi, I'm Michael Halpern. Thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. Our first segment is called Background Briefing. The very first thing I've been thinking about is Jew hatred. Just as a reminder, I now call what used to be labeled anti-Semitism, Jew hatred. Anti-Semitism was based on an ideology. What we're seeing now is not. It is pure hate, Jew hatred. And Jew hatred in the United States is out of control. When an eight-year-old boy playing outside on the sidewalk with his two sisters, one seven years old and the other two years old, is shouted at and then spat on by a 21-year-old, that's Jew hatred. According to police, the young woman studying education and psychology stood in front of the three children and shouted, Hitler should have killed you all. I'll kill you and know where you live. And then she spat at them and then quickly walked away. The kicker is this woman, she wants to be a school psychologist. How a 21-year-old New Yorker assumed that she could do what she did and not have been caught on any of the numerous cameras that are everywhere in the city of New York still amazes me. But that's another story. And the incident was recorded and the New York Police Department Hate Crime Unit and the New York City Police were able to put pictures and a video of the entire event on their Twitter feed. Again, another story for another time. And the woman was identified and she was arrested and charged with a hate crime. After the arrest, the updated New York Police Department hate crime tweet read, update an anti-Jewish hate crime involving eight-year-old. Thanks to help of the public, HCTF detectives assisted the Brooklyn South Warrants arrested Darling Christina, 21, Brooklyn, charges aggravated harassment hate crime act in a manner injurious to child less than 17 times three, menacing HC. Translation, with the help of the public, Christina Darling, the 21-year-old perpetrator, was charged with three counts of aggravated harassment, which is a hate crime. She was acting in a manner that could injure a child under the age of 17. When four Jews from a small town in Texas called Colleyville, three congregants and their rabbi are taken hostage in their synagogue during Sabbath services, while it's streaming live, that's Jew hatred. Thankfully, after nearly 11 hours of harrowing experience, they escaped and none of the hostages were hurt, at least physically. Unfortunately, when the FBI said that the kidnapping of four Jews in their synagogue was not an attack against Jews, but rather that the terrorist was, quote, singularly focused on one issue, unquote, end quote, it was not specifically related to the Jewish community, unquote, that's an open invitation to other Jew hatreds to take action and attack Jews and Jewish sites, especially synagogues. The FBI statement reveals one of two things. Either Jew hatred has become so common that the FBI cannot even see it anymore, or the FBI is afraid to label the attack as one directed against Jews. Neither interpretation is, as our grandparents used to say, good for the Jews. There's no doubt that the hostage taking was directed against Jews. Think about it. Jews compose 2.4% of the population in the United States, 2.4. They compose 0.6% of the population of Texas. One must look very hard to find a Jew in Texas, and even harder to find four Jews in a small community in their synagogue. That cannot be left to chance. It cannot be done without a prior plan to attack Jews. The FBI, the agency tasked with running point on fighting Jew hatred and fighting terror, would so misread the situation is appalling that they later corrected their egregious error is the quintessential case of too little, too late. The damage was done when a first year female Jewish student at Temple University in Philadelphia is tormented and teased by her roommate in person and online because she is a Sabbath observant Jew, that's Jew hatred. The Jewish student was recruited by the university and received a sports scholarship to attend Temple. Her roommate was on the same sports team. When told of the bullying that the student athlete was subjected to, neither her coach nor the school administration addressed the issue. Despite online proof, they doubted the veracity of her claim. The Jewish student withdrew from the team. She is transferring out, leaving the school because she observed the Jewish Sabbath and they teased her about it. Why is this happening? Why is it happening so much? And why is it happening now? Ask a Jew hater and they will quickly blame Israel. They will claim that they are not against Jews, only against Zionists. They will claim that the rise in anti-Semitism and anti-Jewish incidents is a direct result of the way Israel mistreats the Palestinians. 
that Israel is the root cause of all Jew hatred. This is a myth, a falsehood, a lame excuse, a device to fuel further hatred of all Jews. Israel is not perfect. Neither is the Jewish state the root of all evil. Jew haters are evil. I've also been thinking a lot about and carefully watching Iran. Watching Iran's strategic moves is an essential component in keeping the Western world safe. I hope our leaders are watching. I'm not sure that all of them are. If they are not watching, the West is ultimately doomed. If you're under the delusion that the West, especially the United States, has Iran over the barrel, uh, think again. It is Iran that has masterfully maneuvered and is building a new world base, a power base that will challenge the West, especially the United States. The most important segment of the Iranian strategy is they're looking east, looking east. Iranian leadership is pursuing relationships, deals, strong ties with China and Russia, the big boys of the east. Without a doubt, China and Russia pose the greatest of challenges to the objectives of the United States and their fellow Western allies. Put Iran in the mix and the tripartite union between the three looming enemies of the West signals a dangerous and formidable threat to Western values and goals. Here are three recent examples of Iran's effective counters to the United States in the West. Number one, Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi visited Moscow for a face-to-face -face meeting with Vladimir Putin. That meeting took place only days after Iran's foreign minister, Hussein Amir Abduhalalian, returned from a visit to China. Two, in September, Iran joined the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the SCO. The SCO is a powerful group. It is a political, economic, security sharing alliance, also known as the Shanghai Pact. It is the Eastern equivalent to NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, but without a shout out to NATO's Article 5, which states that if one member of the organization is attacked, it is seen as an attack on all the members. The SCO is led by China and Russia. For Iran, membership in this group is status. It provides them with international validity. Becoming a member of the SCO automatically marries Iran into a group that is dedicated to challenging the U.S and Western domination of world affairs. And challenging the US and Western domination of world affairs is a top shelf shared goal of Iran, Russia, and China. The SCO represents 40% of the world's population, three fifths of the land mass of Europe, and 20% of the world's GDP. To understand the orientation and the direction of the power of the SCO, know that the two official languages of the organization are Chinese and Russian. Number three, and I find this most troubling of all, naval exercises are taking place in the Indian Ocean between Iran, China, and Russia. This is the third set of these maneuvers since 2019. The name given to the drills is the 2022 Marine Security Belt. According to the ISNA, ISNA, the Iranian Student News Agency, which quotes Mustafa Tajodlin, a spokesperson for the Iranian military, the purpose of this drill is to strengthen security and its foundations in the region and to expand multilateral cooperation between the three countries to jointly support world peace, maritime security, and create a maritime community with a common future. They want us to know what is happening. They have a website in English. All these threatening things to the West and Western developments are unfolding. The United States and other Western countries plod along and continue to talk and meet and talk and meet in Vienna about Iran's nuclear program. The talks will almost certainly put Iran at odds with the United States and the West. The Chinese and the Russians will certainly be on the side of Iran. We know that Iran gains from affiliations with Russia and China. What do Russia and China get from Iran? Well, the most important benefit to Russia and China is that Iran contributes to their goal of weakening the United States and by extension the West. Iran as an uh, irritant, an irritant to the United States and the Western world, a thorn in the collective side, a threat, a distraction with serious consequences. Despite the desire of the Western world to isolate Iran, Russia and China keep Iran prominently displayed in their fold. Russia and China challenge the United States at every turn. Iran is a tool in the toolbox of Russia and China. The triumvirate, as threatening as it is to the world, is not free of problems. 
Iran is a wild card. Iran does not easily kowtow to orders from others, not from Russia and not from China, nor do they follow instructions. Iran has its own strategies and agenda that do not make them the best partners. All three countries, China, Russia, and Iran, are used to issuing instructions and forcing their way. All three countries automatically use intimidation and threats to achieve their diplomatic objectives. None of them are good at playing together as a team. Iran is working hard to achieve their goals. Russia and China will help them, but there will be a price to pay. One price for Iran and another very different price for the Western world. We do not only need to watch what happens with Iran, we need to watch out. Coming up next, points of view. First up is a column from Ynet. It was originally published in Media Line. The piece was written by Maya Margit, and it was published on January 7, 2022. The piece is entitled, Iranian Attacks Aimed to Challenge Israel's Cyber Prowess. Subtitled, Analysis. Experts say, while most cyber attacks emanating from Iran haven't been very damaging, they can't be ignored. In the coming year, more attacks targeting Israel's critical infrastructure will likely be made as cyberware intensifies. This is how Margit begins. Early Monday morning, the homepage of the Jerusalem Post was hacked to a feature image of the Dimona nuclear facility in southern Israel being blown up. The image was accompanied by a text in both Hebrew and English, reading, We are close to you where you do not think about it. The website and Twitter account of the Post's sister newspaper, Mariv, were hacked with the same image. Both sites were quickly restored. The sites in question were targeted on the second anniversary of the assassination of Iranian General Qasem Soleimani, who was killed by a U.S. drone strike in Iraq. Soleimani was the commander of the Al-Quds Force, a U.S.-designated terrorist group that acts as the foreign operation arm of Iran's Revolutionary Guard. Now, I need to step in here and say something, because that hack was an irritation, nothing more. But the text on the image that they posted was an embarrassment. It was poor English, and it was extremely poor Hebrew. Now, Margit continues. The aim of the attacks, like the one that took down the Jerusalem Post and Mariv websites, Itai Levi said, is the both demoralizing Israelis and to discredit Israel's claim of being a cyber superpower. The Iranians want to show the world that Israel is not a cyber nation as it proclaims itself to be. He said, they want to show Israeli citizens that their data is not as secure as they th- like to think. Professor Isaac Ben Israel, a retired major general in the Israeli Defense Forces, and the director of Tel Aviv University's Interdisciplinary Cyber Research Center says, the idea that there is a cyber war between the governments of Israel and Iran is very much exaggerated. While Israel and Iran blame each other for such attacks, no one really knows who did it. When we say Iran, it is very difficult to know who in Iran, he said. You are not sure if it is done by a group of hackers or by the government. Margit concludes by writing, Ben Israel adds that Iran is not a threat because of its sophistication. Most of its attacks amount more to harassment than damage, but because it's motivated. Israel is a target because they don't like us, he said. In addition, Ben Israel points out that the new cyber threats are always right around the corner. They change very quickly because every day there is a wise guy with a new idea, and those ideas can become a threat in just four to five months, he says. The reality, and this is me speaking, is that Iran is hacking and Israel is a prime target. Israel needs to be better and protect itself better. Iran is trolling for easy prey. They have improved their hacking skills and Israel should not get cocky. But that does not mean that Iran and Israel are in the same league. They are not. Next up is a column from JNS News Service. It was published on January 23rd, 2022. It's authored by George Flesh. The title of the column is Anti-Semitism, The Numbers Don't Lie. Subtitle, for those Jews included who don't believe that Jew hatred has become an ominous threat in America, a close look at the hate crime data may w- be a wake-up call. Flesh begins by laying out the entire idea right up front. 
Jews are the number one target in America for hate crimes in proportion to the population. The recent hostage crisis at the Texas synagogue should be a red flag to alert Jewish leaders to this alarming truth. A Jew is far more likely to be a victim of a hate crime than a black person, a Muslim, a Hispanic, or an Asian. This fact is not well known, yet it is critical to understanding the extent of Jew hatred in America. The reason why it is overlooked is the FBI's method of reporting hate crimes. The FBI website lists 2020 hate crime numbers for various ethnic groups and racial groups, but does not provide the number of hate crimes per capita for each group. Anyone can use simple arithmetic to calculate these numbers based on FBI statistics for 2020. The U.S. Census data and Pew research figures on religious groups in America. Flesh now asks why this has not been exposed and why it is not part of the news. It is certainly newsworthy. He continues, why haven't reporters dug into the FBI data to report the underlying truths? Perhaps too many journalists have become ideologues, not truth seekers, and laziness and incompetence have become common. An investigative treatment of the data revealing the true extent of anti-Semitism might be an inconvenient truth, disturbing the academic race theory that Jews are actually privileged whites. Flesh concludes by writing, our Jewish leaders have made support for social justice causes a major priority. Jewish organizations are enthusiastic supporters of Black Lives Matter movement and the LGBTQ plus rights and have consistently opposed Islamophobia. With notable exceptions, such support and alliances have failed to produce reciprocal support for Jews in Israel. It is now time to attack the sources of Jew hatred and use the community's limited resources to protect Jews first. As the rabbi in Colleyville has demonstrated, being a nice guy is no protection against the violent ideologue blinded by hatred. This is a very well-written, well-thought-out piece. Thank you very much, George Flesh. Coming up, commentary through cartoons where pictures tell the story. I want to show you five cartoons and memes today. First up is just a funny pun about names. It reads, Lance is a pretty uncommon name these days, but in the medieval times, people were named Lance a lot. <laughs> I even had to chuckle the first time. Next up is a play on punctuation and eating or rather dieting. The meme reads, I'm giving up eating chocolate for a month. Sorry, bad punctuation. I'm giving up eating chocolate for a month. Third is a wonderful take on living and daily life. It's a hanging from someone's home. The sign reads, my housekeeping style can best be described as there appears to have been a struggle. This next meme is a classic. It reads, I've just turned off the news and put on a serial killer documentary to relax. It certainly depicts the sad reality of today. And finally, is a meme that pokes fun at our new world. The meme reads, I miss the 1990s when the bread was good for you and nobody knew what kale was. In a moment, more of my own perspective and a few predictions. Israel has changed their policy on COVID and schooling. Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett announced that students who come in contact with confirmed COVID positive patients will not need to isolate. He also said that every student must test twice a week and the government will send antigen tests to the families of every school-aged child. The message Bennett was sending is that parents need to be responsible and not send sick kids, sick students, to school. The Prime Minister said that school children must stay in school. Studies say that children who are double vaccinated are, depending on in the study, either two or four times more protected than unvaccinated youth. One study reported that children vaccinated within the past two months are better protected against Omicron variant and than, uh, than the unvaccinated children or children who received the shot more than two months ago. I pay attention to the travel plans world leaders. And it was very telling to learn that Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi visited Moscow and meeting with his Russian counterpart, Vladimir Putin. I mentioned this earlier. But there's a reason. Iran and Russia are working together in several areas. The most obvious of all is Syria. Both Russia and Iran have propped up Syrian President Assad. 
they have secured his political position and they are helping him retake most of the country. But this is a serious but. Russia is not happy with some of the things that Iran is doing in Syria, and Russia wants to reel Iran in. You can be certain that Rezi and Putin also spoke about the nuke talks in Vienna and the development of Iran's nuke plan. They also spoke about Israel. Putin spoke with Israeli Prime Minister Bennett only days before meeting with Rezi. Putin, without a doubt, updated Rezi on Israel's opposition on Iran and gave him his thoughts on whether Israel is truly prepared to attack Iran and how powerful that strike would be. Russia wants to be a leader of the world, there's no doubt about that, and part of that Russian plan is to be a power broker in the Middle East. The Russians want to outplay the United States and the West in every way, most particularly when it comes to Iran. So how does Russia plan on executing their plan? Simple. The Russians proposed an interim agreement with Iran. According to their proposals, sanctions relief will be instituted in exchange for re-imposition of some of the restrictions on the Iranian nuke program. Both Russia and Iran have been mum on the exact details of the agreement. U.S. officials are either totally in the dark or not divulging any knowledge of the details. Truthfully, I can't imagine that this interim proposal is any different from the proposals that the P5 plus 1 have already proposed in Vienna. The one difference is that this proposal came directly from Russia and not from the West. A drone attack by the Houthi Yemen rebels in Abu Dhabi, the heart of the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, might be the shot heard round the world in 2022. For years, there's been a move to build bridges in the Middle East. This drone attack, which killed three people, hit fuel trucks at the nearby Abu Dhabi airport and caused multiple explosions, has everyone in the Middle East talking and asking questions. In order to get from Yemen to the United Arab Emirates, the drone had to lift off from Yemen, enter the Gulf of Aden, and then the Arabian Sea. At this point, the drone needed to turn into the Gulf of Oman, round the corner and enter the Persian Gulf, pass Dubai and then finally arrive at Abu Dhabi. This was a very well planned attack with a very sophisticated weapon. In response to the drone attack, the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia sent a counterattack against Sana'a, the capital of Yemen. That attack killed at least 12 people. It was the deadliest bombardment in the city since 2019. The Houthis have promised to continue their attack with drones. For the second year in a row, Iran was unable to pay their dues at the United Nations, the UN. That means that once again, Iran will not be able to participate in any of the votes on the United Nations committees or in the General Assembly. The minimum Iran needed to pay this year was $18 million, but it's two years that they need to pay. U.S. sanctions have made it difficult, if not impossible, for Iran to get money they need. Although the United States did free up $7 billion for Iran from a South Korean bank, but it was too late. Under the UN Charter, if a member country's arrears are equal or exceed the amount of dues it should have paid over the preceding two years, the country's voting rights are suspended until the payment is made. Turkey and Israel have had a very cold relationship over the past few years. Lately, however, that relationship is beginning to slowly thaw. But how do you judge how well the relationship is progressing? Foreign ministers of both countries uh, spoke for the first time in years recently. Trade is picking up, and this is very interesting. Turkish President Erdogan has hired an Israeli doctor to treat him, Professor Yitzhak Shapira, a cardiologist and the Deputy General of Sorosky Medical Center in Tel Aviv was hired by the Turkish president. In addition to President Erdogan, Shapira also advises other world leaders on health issues. When the media outlets got the news that Erdogan had hired an Israeli doctor, his PR spin doctors sent the Turkish president out to the basketball court as a whole team of journalists watched him shoot hoops. Islamic Jihad organized a rally in Gaza it was a promotion of pro-Iranian rally and an anti-Saudi Arabian protest. The protest shouted death to the House of Saud. They carried posters with pictures of the head of Yemen's Houthi rebels, 
the group that's fighting against the Yemeni establishment, supported by the Saudis. Hamas controls Gaza, but this time they neither participated nor prevented the protest and rally from taking place. Hamas is worried. They want Saudi support to help build the Gaza's infrastructure. They need Saudi Arabia to contribute to Gaza. Hamas made a mistake. The rally in support of the Houthis was plastered all over the press, all over the Arabic press. The Arabic media covered it in English and in Arabic. Media throughout the Middle East and Europe. Gaza was portrayed as supporting the Houthis and condemning Saudi Arabia. We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. Earlier, I showed a meme about the 90s, when bread was good for you. You remember? In Jewish tradition, bread is essential. A real meal, no matter how much you eat, requires bread. We say the blessing of motzi over bread, and then we say grace, a.k.a. bench, or make a blessing, or birkat mazon afterwards. Benching, by the way, is the Yiddish and German term for a blessing. When one wishes someone a happy new year in Yiddish, they wish them a good gebenched yor, which really and literally translated means a good blessed year. According to the rabbis, bread is the ikar, the principal or primary and essential part of the meal. Everything else is secondary or tefel, which means marginal, non-essential, and not important or valuable. That is true. Even if you were to eat a gallon of ice cream and a bite-sized piece of bread, to the rabbis, a meal is included bread, no question about it. A sudat mitzvah, a meal connected to and part of a parcel of a mitzvah or a, a commandment, la brit milah, a wedding, finishing a tractate of Talmud, has a sudat mitzvah attached to it. The meals for Shabbat and festivals, holidays, all have um, meals. The rabbis all require, always require, bread and motzi and benching after that. In Judaism, bread is sustenance. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Mike Halpern. Let's think out loud again next week on JBS. Mm-hmm.